Good afternoon. It is, it is a delight to see all of you here. Uh, thank you for, for coming. Uh, glad you all survived the storm over the weekend and, uh, and here this afternoon. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you all to this Tak Yan Lee Lecture in the Sciences. And our speaker for today is the 2017-2018 Visiting Scholar in the Natural Sciences for Gordon College. He is Dr. Kenneth Bishop, a hematologist and oncologist who already shared with us three lectures uh, this fall as part of the Herman Lecture Series. Now, Dr. Bishop graduated from Gordon College in 1998 with a major in biology and received an MD and a PhD in cellular immunology from the University of Massachusetts Medical School in 2008. Uh, he completed residency training in internal medicine and fellowship training in hematology and oncology at Brown University between 2008 and 2015. Now, when we first asked Dr. Bishop to serve as our visiting scholar. Dr. Bishop was at Brown University and a VA medical clinic. Uh, since that time, Dr. Bishop has made the move to a new clinic in Attleboro, Massachusetts. Part of the reason I highlight that today is because our founder, A.J. Gordon, was also uh, an alumnus of Brown University. Uh, of course, at that time, Brown University was churning out Baptist ministers. They weren't quite preparing. A lot has changed, Dr. Bishop says. Yeah, not quite churning out an oncologist. Uh, nonetheless, Dr. Bishop has found, followed in our founder's footsteps uh, as a graduate of Brown. Uh, currently, Dr. Bishop's primary professional interests lie in the successful integration of palliative and oncological care. Uh, on a personal note, I've known Dr. Bishop since we were both students here uh, at the same time. And one of the things that, uh, that has always been true of Ken and his wife, Angela, who, who joined us, they both have a, a great uh, personal faith in the Lord and a care for others. I was describing uh, Dr. Bishop to someone earlier today, and I said, you know, Ken has always demonstrated a very keen mind and a gentle heart. And he's, at the same time, always been honest to articulate his struggles with the faith. Uh, and how all of this comes together in a, in a painful and broken world. And I think that's one of the things I really appreciate about Ken is that, that willingness to authentically articulate um, our journey as Christians um, and that integration truly of faith and inquiry. So I want to welcome Dr. Bishop and his wife, Angela, who's also a Gordon alumna, uh, and their two children, Sam and Olivia, and Dr. Bishop's mother, uh, who is a great fan, uh, Ellen. So we want to wel welcome you, Dr. Bishop, and your family. Well, thank you, everybody. It's uh, an absolute pleasure to be back today, uh, especially since I've had a chance to meet a lot of you. Uh, Kevin came down and joined me in clinic for a day, and we had I, I, I had fun. I can't speak for him, but it was uh, it was great. Uh, so it's been it's been fantastic to reengage with the community here, and and I really appreciate the chance to do that. Uh, my talk's a little bit different today. Uh, it's, it's very kind of patient-centered, uh, and I wanted to uh, speak a little bit more to the, um, the, the aspect of connection that my job gives me the opportunity uh, to, to have. Uh, the, the patients that I treat are uh, much more interesting than the, the diseases themselves, and I think that's something that really can get lost uh, during medical school and during residency. But uh, during fellowship, it, it really came back to, the, back to the forefront for me because uh, that was the time when I started to uh, treat a lot more patients who had uh, terminal diseases. So it, uh, it really um, brings the personal aspect of, of the, the profession uh, into the front. When I started Oncology Fellowship at Brown, one of the recent changes that they'd made uh, was to create a fellow-staffed clinic. And that meant right from the start, uh, the fellows had our own uh, panel of cancer or blood patients for which we were primarily responsible. We had attending oversight, but every phone call, every order, every decision was made by the fellow first, uh, and then approved or usually modified by a supervising attending. It was extremely daunting for me. Uh, it felt a little bit like uh, somebody with a learner's permit being put into a racetrack, uh, but at this point, I recognize it as one of the most valuable aspects of my fellowship training. Not only was it the highest learning stakes environment that I'd ever been in, but it was the closest I'd ever been to a small number of patients consistently. 
One of the patients I developed was a man in his, uh, one of the patients I uh, uh, acquired was a man in his 70s. Uh, he developed back pain and leg weakness. So we ordered images and his MRIs showed tumors in his spine that were compressing his spinal cord. It was causing pain and causing him some weakness. The cancer had started in his lung uh, and then spread to other sites, which meant it was incurable. Based on the specifics of his tumor, we were able to treat his cancer with a daily pill rather than with intravenous chemotherapy. And his side effects were largely tolerable. One clinic visit a few months after his initial diagnosis, we had gotten to know each other a little bit better. And he had a very emotional moment when he asked me the question that I think likely enters the mind of any person who's diagnosed with a terminal disease. He, with great anguish, said, what, what did I do to deserve this? And on reflection, that's a very different question from what were the details of my life that increased my risk of developing this situation. Uh, and answering the question of, you know, what does anybody do to deserve something like this? Uh, the answer is nothing. It doesn't matter who the person is or what they've done in their life. Nothing about a person could ever make them deserve uh, a diagnosis of terminal cancer. He had smoked cigarettes for most of his life, so naturally any thinking person's impulse is to point to this. And then our coping strategy, usually to protect ourselves from tragic circumstances, is to develop a narrative of some form of some sense of consequence or justice for his lifestyle choices. Another word for this is blame. I've had other patients often use that exact same word. I have nobody to blame but myself for this. I did this to myself. And I think it's important to take a moment to disagree. To be fair, part of my job is to be on the patient's side almost no matter what. So it's a little bit of a biased perspective. But I think cases like this illustrate a larger truth about the tendency to derive, uh, the tendency to try to derive meaning from our circumstances. In this specific case, part of this man's fate was determined by the relationship that our culture has had with cigarettes over the last century. To begin with, the tobacco industry has a long history of casting aspersions on evidence suggesting that cigarettes are harmful. An early example of this can be found in an open memo that was uh, released by the Tobacco Industry Research Committee in 1954, which reads for, for more, quote, for more than 300 years, tobacco has given solace, relaxation, and enjoyment to mankind. At one time or another, during those years, critics have held it responsible for practically every disease of the human body. One by one, these charges have been abandoned for lack of evidence. Regardless of the record of the past, the fact that cigarette smoking today, mind you, this is 1954, should even be suspected as a cause of serious disease is a matter of deep concern to us. This was released to the American public. The, tobaccoing, uh, the tobacco marketing machine went so far as to include the healthcare system in their advertising campaigns suggesting that smoking specific brands could confer health benefits or that doctors specifically endorse smoking for healthful reasons. And when we look at the trend of lung cancer deaths in men over the past few decades, we see a very interesting pattern. You'll notice that starting in 1950 and peaking in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, there's a steady climb of lung cancer rates. And then thankfully they start to drop off. And part of this is because of these marketing strategies that the tobacco companies employed. The tobacco marketing machine started to broaden its scope during World War II, when tobacco companies actually supplied US military with free cigarettes to be included in the soldiers' ration kits. This created a generation of brave and nicotine-addicted heroes. And this addiction followed our men home. An ancillary success for the tobacco companies was the creation of a nationwide association between masculinity and bravery and cigarette smoking. So further evidence that the popularity of tobacco use is the consequence of strategic marketing 
is illustrated by a shift in advertising tactics in the 1960s when they recognized that they'd reached a saturation point and an arrest in sales growth. So they sought to expand their market into other demographics and other, quote, benefits of smoking such as weight control and independence were touted to American women. And if you look at the mortality data for lung cancer for our female cancer population, you'll see that there's almost a perfectly time-shifted correlate in rates of uh, lung cancer deaths, which also thankfully started downtrending about 15 years ago. So my point is, the first thing that most of us think about when we hear about someone who will most likely die from their lung cancer is that their cancer was a direct result of their poor decision to continue to indulge their desire for cigarettes. And the reason I think it's important to acknowledge this is because it's an illustration of our tendency and need to impose a narrative on our circumstances or on the circumstances of others in order to make our world make sense. Uh, this may not always be the most loving approach uh, in our relationships with others. Were I to cling to this idea as a physician, as comforting as it is to me as a non-smoker, it does nothing to help me love this patient more. A better way for me to do this is to remember that love often requires us to be in close proximity with other people's pain. And a willingness to do this can actually be an expression of love in itself. Second patient I'd like to talk about uh, is another patient that I met during fellowship. She had reported headaches to her doctor uh, and, and was having dizziness associated with them. So her primary care doctor ordered CAT scans and found a mass in her lung and in her brain. She had started radiation treatments for her brain metastases and then came to my fellows clinic uh, to talk about which chemotherapy would be best for her type of cancer. Communicating with her was a challenge because two decades prior, she'd suffered a stroke that had injured the left side of her brain where the speech centers are found. This type of stroke illustrates how precisely our brains are constructed and that even a relatively small stroke can have a huge impact on somebody's ability to function. Her comprehension was unaffected. She did not have any issue with cognition or with processing, just with expressing herself. So she and her husband had developed a system for communicating with others. She was able to answer most yes or no questions or questions with one word answers. But for more complex answers, she'd flick her gaze over to her husband and he'd supply what he thought would be her answer and she'd confirm or refute. Part of the process of developing a treatment plan with a new patient is learning about their life separate from their cancer. So one of the questions I had asked this woman was how long she and her husband had been married. She beamed with pride and she answered 10. And then her husband smiled and he said, no, you know that's not right. So she looked to him for help and waited for him to assist. You want me to tell him? He asked her and she nodded. 50 years, he told me, like he could not conceive a finer achievement. They were 19 and 20 when they got married. When the conversation did turn to her cancer, we reviewed her images and the details of her type of cancer and what the different treatment choices might be. When we were nearing the latter part of the visit, her, the patient's husband asked me, so could you tell us what stage of cancer this is? Which, shame on me, is a piece of information that I assumed that another doctor had already told them. And if there's one thing that almost anybody knows, it's that stage four is the stage of cancer you don't want, which was this lady's stage. I'd been carrying on the whole conversation as if they knew that without gauging their depth of understanding of the situation. So I told them, and it was not what they had been expecting. They both broke into shocked tears, and so I took a few minutes not to say anything and gave them some time and some space which they took as if I was not even there. Five decades together, and it wasn't difficult for them to truly find each other in that moment without my presence making a bit of difference. I've had to tell 
many other people this type of news. And there was a big difference that time. Often patients will deflate into themselves. You can watch their world change just by watching their face. And everything else in the room goes away. Their chin usually lowers to their chest. Their shoulders sink inward. Their whole world seems to fill with white noise. And then often nothing you say to them after that uh, means anything to them or is even registered. Whereas this woman looked over to her husband, who demonstrated no shame in his unrestrained crying. He was so used to filling in the conversational gaps for her, and now he was so hindered by grief and his own inability to speak a full sentence. She cried too, mostly silently, and watched him. And the expression on her face was not what I typically see in this setting. Her eyes were tearful and open and full, and they were totally fixed on him not threatened or frightened, like most who have just received this type of news. She seemed almost wistful. And so I said, you're sadder for him more than you are for yourself, aren't you? I asked her, and she nodded, and she cried more. They were so absorbed in each other and so flattened by this piece of news that I ended the visit, and I let them stay in the room until they chose to go, because the details of the treatment could wait until the next time we met. Fifty years together made a terminally ill woman grieve for her partner more than for herself because she knew how profound his loss would be. We never explored her worldview. We never looked, uh, talked about her thoughts about death or the possibility of an afterlife. But this visit has come back to my mind many times as one of the most profound demonstrations of love I've ever seen. A woman's love for her, her husband that was so outwardly directed, that her own symptoms, her own pain, and even the reality of her impending death were a secondary concern for her. It was the loss that she knew her husband would experience during the process of her illness that grieved her the most. So we've discussed two patients with stage four cancer, which for most cancers means that the disease is incurable. In cancers for which we do not have good screening methods, such as mammograms or colonoscopies, it is unfortunately relatively common for a cancer to first be diagnosed in the end stage. And one of the most common incredulous questions that I am asked when this happens is, how is it possible that the cancer got to this point without me knowing about it? Because very often in the early stages, cancer does not hurt. Unlike an infection or a foreign body, Cancer is our own cells, cells that have escaped the normal boundaries of growth and death and have con continued to divide for the sole reason of purposeless survival and propagation. Cancer spreads when it is able to erode through normal tissue and enter the bloodstream or the lymphatic system or invade tissues directly adjacent to it. As human beings, and especially in our culture, we have a tendency to think of pain as something to avoid at great cost or from which to distance ourselves. In the example of cancer, the presence of pain in the early stages would actually be a significant benefit because it means we would be able to cure a cancer with surgery or with some other minimally invasive technique in the early stage. This pain would actually be informative to us. It would be useful, telling us that our body is being damaged. It could actually teach us something. We need to remember that there are times when pain has a purpose, and sometimes a crucial purpose. We can look to Christ's relationship with pain for many valuable lessons. A prominent one is the fact that a significant part of his ministry on earth was healing the physically ill. We often observe the mission of Christ through a spiritual lens, but we can't forget his commitment to physical wholeness also. In the first chapter of Mark, Christ encounters a man with leprosy who expresses his faith and was healed because of this. Unlike some other accounts of Christ healing, in which he simultaneously heals physical ailments and forgives sins, this encounter does not describe Jesus addressing the man's sins directly. Mark tells us that Christ's motive uh, for healing the man is pity for him. Uh, likely that the man lived... Uh, with daily pain, and certainly lived with daily emotional pain. 
We also know from scripture that Christ himself experienced immense physical and emotional pain. And the mystery of the crucifixion is one of the most profound superimpositions of love and pain that we have in history. In the life of Jesus Christ, we have a continuous expression of love for the Father, for his fellow human beings, and perhaps most profoundly for those who opposed and tortured him. In Christ's death on a Roman cross, we have one of the most desolate images of both physical and emotional pain. And the amplitude of that pain was in proportion to Christ's love for us. In his willingness to endure both the destruction of his physical being and the spiritual anguish of being separated from his father, I don't know if we have any choice but to speculate that on a cosmic scale, this pain was somehow necessary for our redemption from death. Otherwise, it would possibly not have been the plan that God devised. This perspective has been one of the most important shifts in my own thinking, both as a family member of a cancer patient and as a physician. Oncology is a field that re requires nearly constant interaction with people's pain in physical, emotional, and spiritual form. And I think it's common for us, either consciously or unconsciously, to interpret pain as a manifestation of God's displeasure or as a consequence for a fallen nature. And I've come to think that this is probably a very limited understanding. Hopefully, the event of the crucifixion as an example of outwardly directed love, love that the Father has for us, that he delivered through his Son, can help us reframe and redefine the pain that we experience in our own lives. Perhaps the presence of pain in our lives is not solely a manifestation of our own choices and not necessarily a punishment for an imperfect nature. But perhaps it is something that is pointing to something that we need to learn. I believe that Christ's example for us also demonstrates that the pain of others is not something from which to protect ourselves or to insulate ourselves against. But rather, perhaps, these are the most obvious opportunities for us to enter more deeply into the lives of others. Perhaps sometimes the sources of pain in our lives and the lives of those around us are actually paths to a more profound love. Thank you. Thank you.